Hi everyone, my name is Henry Murima and uh, I come uh, from a company called Vaadin. And um, it's really great to be here in San Francisco with the brightest software developers in the world. Um, and also really great to be a part of the Quit community, which is, as you guys know, it's a global community. And uh, from my horrible accent, you can probably uh, guess that I'm not from here either. So uh, I'm actually from Finland, the company is from Finland. And um, to open this presentation up, uh, I tried to look at something interesting about Finland for you guys, and I found this. Um, yeah, turns out that uh, Finland has the most metal bands per capita in the world, and um, rest of the Nordics, uh, Sweden and Norway are doing pretty well as well. And uh, if you think about it, it's, it's not really surprising. Uh, Headbanging is a really good way to stay warm. Um, <laughs> I'm not here to talk about musical preferences. Um, instead, I will talk to you uh, about functional programming, following up with some reactive programming, and then uh, tying it up how this all relates to uh, UI development. Um, I'm not actually about to talk about um, specific UI technologies that much, but instead of how the uh, way of constructing programs with a functional and reactive way apply to that side. Um, I will write some uh, live code at some point. Let's see how it goes. And also, uh, I'm going to make two claims uh, in, the, in the talk. And uh, you might find them uh, quite controversial. Let's see. But anyway, uh, my goal for this talk is to convince you guys that both functional and reactive programming styles are uh, really nice and uh, that uh, it re it's really worth your while to la start learning and apply them uh, with your day job and maybe the hobby projects as well. All right, so functional programming. If we go to Wikipedia, we can say it's uh, something like this. And uh, when I started learning about this a couple of years ago, um, I thought, OK, doesn't so, sound so bad. I did my time in the university and know my way around some math. Sure, OK, I started Googling. and. Um, I really quickly run into a huge pile of unfamiliar familiar terms. And uh, the problem was I can't even pronounce all of them. So <laughs> what's the deal with that? So highly theori theoretical, it must be complex, but there must be some practical about it. So I started Googling that instead. Um, first, I learned about pure functions. So a pure function is basically a function that doesn't touch any state outside of its parameters. So it does something with the parameters and, and returns the result, and that's it. Um, but isn't an application basically about modifying some state? So how do you actually manage my state? And um, that's a question. And the answer is that, yeah, state is bad. Stay away from it. OK, and this was what kind of a reindeer I was after that. Um, turns out that uh, trying to learn functional programming this way is a really good way to be frustrated and dismiss the whole thing as uh, academic nonsense. Um, one of the messages I want to convey to you guys today is that um, if you run it into this, uh, you are doing it wrong. Uh, in my opinion, the best way is to start writing some code, get some real world stuff that you want to implement and start applying the functional principles and learning as you go, instead of just trying to learn the uh, theory first. Um, and why? Well, we are looking for new ways to think about problems, um, new solutions for the old problems that we have been uh, in hardship to solve before. And uh, then calls, of course, to write less code that does more. And one of the key principles I like, uh, I'm not sure uh, who was it that uh, crystallized it this well, that we want to write code that uh, says what we want to happen instead of hand-holding the computer to uh, have it do and forcing it uh, do how it's done. So what instead of how? I think that's important. Right, so functional programming. Uh, I'm going to teach you everything about it. Uh, by the way, I'm going to use Scala as 
the language here. Uh, anyone here familiar with Scala? Couple of hands, that's good. Uh, if you don't uh, know the syntax, don't worry about it. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand and ask. Uh, but basically, uh, one thing that you will find uh, difficult uh, if you're coming from Java is that we don't specify any types usually, or we don't have to specify them because Scala has so good type inference. But okay, um, functional programming is about functions, obviously. And the key idea here is that we can take a function and store it in a variable and pass it around as any other value. And here we can actually see that we are creating a new, new function that takes a number, which is of type int. Uh, in Scala, it's a other way around from Java. And with the allow, uh, we denounce that uh, what happens when we get those parameters. So of course, here we have the square function. And we can call it like any other function, even though it's uh, stored in a, va in a value. And the second core concept of functional programming is something called higher order functions. And this sounds uh, much more uh, complex than, than it actually is. Basically, a higher order function is uh, any function that get, can get some other function's parameter or return uh, another function as a result of its computation. And the most important, I would say, uh, higher order function that uh, a functional programmer will work all the time is map. Uh, I'm sure that uh, all of you can uh, directly understand what the map does. It takes a uh, some set uh, of values, a sequence, for example, or collection, and applies some transformation that you specify as a lambda function and returns a new collection with those transformed elements. So it doesn't touch the count of the uh, elements in the sequence, only uh, transform them. And the second one is, of course, filter, which doesn't actually uh, alter the elements, but only selects a subset uh, of them and it works so that I will, uh, you will give it a lambda that will take an element as a parameter and then uh, return a boolean. And I hope that the example is quite self-explanatory. Uh, one thing here is that underscore in Scala means that uh, it's the default parameter that is given uh, to the function. So I'm not actually having any arrows here uh, for the parameters because this function only takes one parameter and the underscore is a placeholder for, placeholder for it. And also one thing about Scala, uh, I like to use uh, the loose notation, which means that I'm calling the map function on the nums uh, collection here and give the square as the parameter. I could uh, put the dot here and brackets uh, or parentheses uh, over the square, but uh, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, hopefully you can uh, read this. Um, all right. Okay, actually one more impo important thing here. Um, we can also combine uh, collections using functional uh, operations. So uh, zip is one, there are lots of others. Um, but the important thing that uh, functional collections will support all of them. And also, if you're coming to Java 8, um, it will uh, support all of these in almost identical uh, notation. Right, so that's uh, functional programming 101. Uh, time for the first, first claim I promised you. Uh, who agrees with this? Okay, a couple of hands, that's good. Um, of course, um, the point here is that uh, you shouldn't go maverick and just use everything and uh, uh, not care about uh, null pointer exceptions. Uh, the point is that this day and age, we actually have much better tools to uh, approach uh, the issue of a potentially absent value. Um, and what we can do here is use something called option, or in Java 8, it's optional. And it's basically a type uh, that you can see as a collection that will hold uh, zero or one elements inside it. 
and it's typed. So uh, we can see here that this option can only ha hold integers. And if we want to uh, have this uh, value inside an option, we use uh, sum, uh, uh, wrap the value in sum. And if there is no value, we use a static object, none, uh, which will, of course, mean that this option has no values in it. And also, since we can wrap um, any nullable reference in an option, there is no reason at all to write code that could at some point actually address or handle a null value. So even if you are using some API that uh, will use null to signal uh, a missing value, just wrap them in an option and you're good to go. OK, so how do we actually use the option? Let's say we have this kind of API for uh, fetching users. Um, and of course, option here is a really good way to uh, signal even to the users of the API that if, you, if we can find the, the user that you are looking for, then you get the um, uh, none type there. Um, right, so using actually those values from option, um, option has, like uh, many others, collections, um, is defined uh, a property or function that will tell us uh, if there's a value or not and then get function that will actually retrieve the value out of the option. But this is actually a null check in disguise. Don't do that. Uh, instead, we can remember that uh, option is a collection. So we can use the functional uh, operations on it. Uh, if we want to do some side effects for it, it's a really good way for it. And in this case, we can see that uh, it's a collection. So u, in this case, uh, if it can actually find any values in the user option, uh, it will print the uh, user's name in this case. Uh, completely safe. Also, uh, mapping is a really good way. Actually, this is used more, in my opinion, uh, to get some stuff out of the value that might be uh, none or not. And in the interesting thing here is that this is no longer uh, an option of user, it's an option of string. So it also casts it uh, as it goes. And then handling the values with uh, some default, uh, in case it's none, we use get or else, um, which is quite self-explanatory, I hope. Um, all right, so to demonstrate these practices uh, in um, in a detailed way, I wrote a small application to show, show you guys uh, how these things can be used in a real world case. Um, and it looks like this. Um, yeah, it's not a business app. I, I guess most of us do business apps in our day job, uh, but I think those are sometimes boring. So I instead uh, wrote a game. Um, and I named it Dungeon Game. And apparently, this is because uh, I'm as bad as naming things as some with graphic design, so sorry about that. Um, but I hope the actual, actual um, stuff that's going on behind the scenes that I will show you will be more interesting. Um, so the point is that this is a dungeon with some walls. Um, there's a player, the green square. Uh, there are some enemies that are carrying lamps, which means that the uh, area around the enemies is line, uh, lined up. And also, uh, the player has a limited side range. And the problem that we are going to solve is, uh, how can we find out uh, which uh, illuminated cells uh, the player can see? Um, and you can also actually find the project in GitHub uh, if you want to play with it. All right, so let's talk about uh, the actual data model side first and uh, continue with, with the UI. Um, here we have the uh, dungeon that represents uh, the grid the, and the entities in it. Uh, the player and the uh, monsters or enemies, they are uh, both entities, subclasses of entity. And cell is re represented by a case class, 
which is um, a special kind of class that will expose the parameters to it uh, with getters and setters. And also I added um, a plus operator for it so that we can sum two cells together. Okay, so the task is to actually implement the visible illuminated cells function. So let's see how it goes. I have the project in Eclipse here. Okay. So as the first thing, uh, we're going to start with uh, finding out what light sources are there in the world. So um, we remember that the enemies were carrying lamps. So basically, the enemies uh, are the light sources in this game. And we can uh, use the map. Uh, function to map those enemies into light sources. So um, the values that we are getting out, uh, no, that's entities, not enemies. So the values that we are getting out of this uh, is a tuple uh, entity and the location that the entity is standing in. So it will match this pattern. And what we are going to return when we get the, this kind of uh, pair, we will return a tuple, uh, put the parentheses over it, and we will return the cell and entity's illumination radius, which is a, uh, one property that the entity, entity has. So now we have here uh, a sequence or a collection of light sources in the game. All right, so the next step. Uh, is to find out the cells uh, that are illuminated over those light sources. And I have here um, a really trivial uh, helper class that contains some methods to find out those uh, cells. And here we can see uh, this area method will get a cell uh, with, uh, that represents the center of the light source and the radius of how far this light source will illuminate. <laughs> and it will return a sequence of cell. And you can see the for uh, keyword here, but this is actually not a for loop. This is something called for comprehension, which is basically mapping over some set of values and producing something else um, as a result of that, uh, that mapping. And here we can see that uh, x is getting values from uh, center x minus radius to center x plus radius and y is doing the same for the y coordinates, of course. So we are getting the cells in the rectangle uh, with the given radius that is centered uh, on the center cell. And note that this actually doesn't know anything about our world. It doesn't know about walls uh, or if there are holes in the floor or something like that. It's just a basically a, uh, abstract not a, uh, representation of this uh, area. And also, we have a second helper method here uh, that will just call this area with uh, the values in this tuple. Small helper method. All right, so we have the light sources here. And we want the illuminate light, light sources. Um, So basically, we can just use a map to uh, get the light sources converted into the areas. So and my helper method is here, like that. It's as simple as that. The uh, area is some function uh, from a, a tuple of a cell and a radius into a sequence of cells. But actually here, uh, if we look at what is going on, this will be a sequence. And uh, one uh, call here will return a sequence. So actually, the type of this will be uh, a sequence of sequences. And that's actually not what we want. So we can actually use flat map instead of map. Um, flat map is exactly what it sounds like. It's a, a mapping operation that will uh, flatten uh, any collections that it might produce. So 
that's it. Now we have a, actually a list of all illuminated cells in the world. Next step is to filter out all cells that are not the, in the visible uh, range of the player. So that's quite straightforward as well. Um, we don't have that uh, method yet, so we're going to get back to that. But let's assume it works. Uh, and the last step in getting all the visible illuminated cells in the game area is to actually uh, use um, the fact that we have the uh, complete set of floor cells available to us um, as a state of the game. And we can just use uh, intersect, which is a set operation, to get that. And set class uh, contains that for us, so that's quite easy as well. So no. Like this. And actually, in Scala, um, all blocks are uh, st uh, expressions instead of statements. So uh, this block here has a value, and in Scala, uh, the last expression in a block is the value of that whole block. So we don't actually need any return statement here. Uh, this w the result of this uh, operation will be returned. All right, so that's it, uh, except that we need to know um, if a cell is a player's uh, side rate range or not. So let's do that next. Let's start by getting a handle to the player. Um, well, the player is uh, a part of the entities collection. Um, and we can use uh, the keys uh, function here to get the collection of the keys, which is a collection of entities, but we want the player. And we can use something called uh, collect, which is basically a filter and a map uh, in, in one. So we will create the pattern that when it's matched, it will return what we are looking for. So whenever we get the something that is a player, we will return it and that's it. Um, now collect is actually a uh, getting us an iterable of players, but as we are quite sure that the collection will contain only one a player, we can call the head method, which will actually get the first element. But we want to be sure that uh, this is, if this is called, for example, before the entity is initialized, uh, this will fail because there will be no head. So instead, we can uh, just get uh, the head option of the collection. And we will also rename it as a player opt, denoting that it's an opt option of player. And we can actually save it. And compile will tell it that this will be type of option of player. Um, can you guys see it? All right. Next up, the position of player, because we need that when we are figuring out where the cell is. Uh, <coughs> relative to the player. Um, player posh opt. I'm terrible at naming things. Sorry about that. Um, that's uh, also quite easy. We can just take the uh, player opt and map it to our entities. Entities as you can see, it's basically a mapping from entity to cell, and we can use that um, directly uh, as a parameter to the map function. All right, uh, next step is to get uh, the site range of the player. The player has a um, member for that. Um, which we can use. Um, get out from the option using map, as we saw earlier, uh, site range, like that. But now we actually don't want an option. 
we are now mapping um, this into an option of int, but we actually want the number out of it. So uh, we can use get or else, and or else means that if there is no value uh, in player opt, what do we return? OK, we can return 0. That's fine. Uh, everything will work. Nothing will crash. And uh, basically, we just uh, won't see anything. But that's fine. There is no player to see anything, so no problem. All right. Now we are ready to implement player's side range. So let me copy it from there. Um, OK, I have a small problem here. These are no values. That's good, but we actually want them to be functions instead. And to actually get the side range, uh, we will take the player position, which is an uh, option here, and use map for that. And if we get into this uh, map, we can see that uh, this will not be an option anymore. It will, of course, be uh, the cell where the player is standing. And when we get uh, the player's uh, position uh, for somewhere, somewhere uh, we will map uh, it to a boolean, basically calculating the distance between the player and the cell, and see if it, seeing it if it's smaller or equal uh, to the player's side range. So, so our map logic actually contains a method for that. So distance from the cell. Uh, yeah, actually, some one thing is missing. We of course need to give this a parameter, which is the cell that we are uh, comparing to, and play, player side range. So no. Like that. Now we get the distance between those cells, and it must be smaller or equal than uh, player side range. All right. So now we are getting uh, the information if this cell is uh, close enough to the player or not. But we are getting it as a boolean, which uh, sorry option of boolean, which is actually not what we want. We want the straight out. Uh, boolean out of it because uh, this has to, has to return a boolean otherwise it it can't be used to filter so we again use uh, get or else and the or else clause will of course be activated if this uh, has a none inside of it which means that we don't have a player so we can just uh, return false here and what do you know? This compiles. Um, so this is actually everything we need to do uh, to figure out um, the cells uh, that the player can see in our uh, imaginary little game. And uh, if we look at this code, uh, we can see that uh, it's quite small. I think you agree. Uh, it's broken up into really small pieces, uh, most of it uh, one-liners. And if you can calculate, uh, OK, uh, we are actually iterating to all kinds of collections, looking for values and co comparing things to each other and, and so forth. But count how many loops or if statements are there. Uh, zero of both. And uh, in my opinion, at least, uh, this means that as long as these maps and filters and intersects and so forth, as, as long as they do what, uh, what they're supposed to be doing, uh, the actual uh, possibilities of bugs in these codes is really small. And also, we can see the whole class here. Uh, this class is extremely easy to test. Just mock some. OK, there's some silly code there. Um, just mock some stuff into the floors and entities, and off you go calling the methods. Um, the project doesn't compile it. There's a couple of other things in here, like initializing uh, the entities. So let me actually get them in. So. OK. 
Okay, here we go. And now it compiles and uh, should be should be running here as well since I have it have it running in in a jetty. So what's the URL here? Okay. Demo effect. Okay, here we go. And if we are running here with the arrow keys, we can actually see that how the vision range is changing. And also there's a nice um, nice little addition that is seeing that we are trying to run into wall or into enemy. And in the lower uh, right corner, you can see that uh, it telling us with a notification. So this was actually all there is to implement uh, the visual vision calculation. All right. Um, who thinks that this is uh, easy to understand? OK, a couple of persons. OK, that's good. Um, who thinks that uh, this may contain a huge amount of bugs? Nobody. Um, I don't think so, I, so either, even if I wrote it. Um, but I think this is a, a pretty good demonstration um, uh, on the possibilities and the power uh, of functional programming. Um, right, so that's functional programming. Um, summary, uh, using small functions uh, with clear responsibilities is a really nice and a clear way of expressing what you want to do. And also the functional uh, constructs allow us to concentrate on what we want to happen instead of how the computer should be going about it. For example, um, hand-holding it with uh, some indexes on a for loop or something like that, or a while loop uh, conditions and, and so forth. Um, and chaining those functional operators is a really, really nice way to transform any data into basically to anything, anything else. And one tidbit I hope you remember from this talk is that option is something that you really, really want to use. Uh, even if you don't plan to uh, go all in with functional programming, when you are getting a chance to work with Java 1.8, please start using option. Don't design APIs that dis uh, return nulls. All right. Next up, reactive programming. Uh, how many of you guys uh, know or understand what is uh, functional reactive programming? Some hands, OK. Um, the core idea of functional uh, reactive programming is to uh, introduce a new core concept um, into the set of tools the programming is using. And this is a value that is changing over time. So what's the difference between uh, these two assignments here? That is uh, a formula in a spreadsheet cell. Uh, what happens when B changes? Uh, over here, nothing. A is what it was when the assignment was executed. And on the spreadsheet, uh, everything that is depending on uh, B1 will be, of course, be changing. And this is the fundamental idea that we can actually use in our software when we are writing code as well. And the um, second really important thing here is that we can compose those uh, changing values, uh, mapping, filtering, uh, whatever. Uh, and actually, a spreadsheet cell formula is a really good example of that. We can write any stuff that the uh, spreadsheet that we're using can accept and transforming the values from cell to each other. Um, actually, having some values in a UI to change uh, when some other da data uh, elsewhere changes, it's not a, uh, not a new concept and uh, many uh, UI technologies nowadays support it, for example, Vardin. 
has this uh, property and the property data source construct and uh, a GUID framework called Tessel actually has a um, even more um, useful way to bind uh, UI elements into some data and it will actually handle those updates. And uh, we actually have a, a intro talks on both technologies tomorrow. So if you want to hear more, please join those talks. Um, but I think that uh, this is actually not enough. And this brings us to my second claim. Who agrees with this one? Two hands, OK. Um, I'm not saying that events are bad. Uh, far, from, far from it. It's a proven technique to have two uh, pieces of code to communicate with each, with each other. Uh, however, working with the event objects themselves and the values that uh, coming in wrapped in those event objects, um, that's quite clumsy in my opinion. And we can do much uh, better by applying some reactive thinking uh, on passing stuff from uh, between pieces of code. So I'm going to introduce uh, here a library called Erox Java. Um, it's a library by Netflix, and they use it uh, quite heavily in large parts of their infrastructure. And they actually um, write a lot of blog posts about it. So uh, if you're interested, see how Netflix builds their reactive systems that serves us the uh, great uh, shows. Um, I recommend that you uh, do a quick Google search about it. And in the core of the Arc Java is something called observable. And this represents a value that can be changing over time. And here we can see a trivial example of creating one observable from a list. Um, and then we can subscribe to that observable to do something with those values. And now some of you might think that, uh, well, this is just an event listener in disguise, but actually it's not. Uh, the secret sauce here is that observable offers a fully functional API to manipulate and uh, combine it with uh, other observables. And if we take this idea to, to the conclusion, we can actually uh, figure out that we can ex try to express our whole logic as combinations on these observables by uh, getting all the data inputs, for example, uh, user interface components when a user is manipulating, we can get those events or the values that the user is entering in them as a stream uh, of values in a, inside the observable, uh, implement our logic with the comp um, uh, combinations of observables, and then plug the, those resulting observables straight uh, into our model or the UI to actually update the UI. So no other uh, logic needed than uh, functional combinations of observables. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, we can uh, use the functional operators on them. Uh, and just like uh, collections, we can use uh, combinations as well. Um, one small technology here that I want to highlight uh, is something called Erex Vardin which is a trivial uh, add-on library to Vardin uh, that will convert any input component in a Vardin uh, into an observable. And also, you can hook, hook up some observables um, into other components that can accept values. The uh, API of uh, Arox Vardin is like three methods or something like that, or five, uh, couple of static methods. Uh, but they still enable you to uh, actually approach the building your UI logic in a completely different way. Um, there's a URL uh, about the blog post that will tell you all about it. Um, but OK, let's um, actually uh, apply this uh, in our game. So the key here is that uh, these up, down, left, right, the, those are the UI components in the screen, if you remember. There were four buttons uh, below the screen. Uh, those are those UI components. And we have this click events method available in the component. 
uh, that will return an observable of click event. And we will take all those four buttons and map the observable into uh, a function that actually doesn't care about uh, the click event itself. It's not important as we know the direction. Uh, we will call uh, the try move method with some cell, which is actually not an absolute cell in the world. Instead, if it's a, a direction uh, where the button is pointing. For example, if we are wanting to go up, uh, the x-coordinate will be the same, and the y-coordinate will be uh, minus 1. And here we can see what it's doing. So basically, it's staying the player position and adding uh, the delta to that cell. And also important here in our UI logic is that we will filter that option uh, with a function that will tell us uh, from the board if that uh, direction is actually a legal move or not. So basically, uh, here we have a vector um, of observable, observables. And we can then uh, use a convenience method in observable static class to actually flatten those into single observable that will emit option of cell whenever any of those buttons is pressed. OK, then we need to handle the legal moves. Um, the move observer um, will emit uh, an option of cell uh, whenever a legal move is attempted. And here we can, uh, again, collect only those values that contain a legal move, so they are some cell. And then we will just actually tell the board to put the player in that cell and return the new set of uh, visible illuminated cells. Uh, again, this will be an observer. Uh, observable, sorry. Actually, yes, there's a typo in the slides. This, of course, should be observable, not an observer. And since our board uh, that is actually drawing the squares on the screen uh, implements uh, the observer uh, interface, we can just directly subscribe the board uh, to this observable. And this way, whenever the player clicks anything, any button there, uh, we will actually uh, tell the board to get the cells and redraw it. And as a bonus, uh, we will um, create a new observable, observable from the moves that contains the illegal, uh, illegal moves by checking that uh, this uh, option must be empty. And subscribe uh, one function here. Don't care about the actual parameter. It will be none. And just show some uh, text on screen. Uh, whenever an illegal move is emitted. All right, then summary. Um, I want uh, to remind that these technique, techniques can be really powerful, and also that uh, they're not. Uh, sometimes I hear that functional programming, reactive programming is really hard, and it takes a huge uh, learning curve to actually get any, anything done. This is not true. You can get started uh, whenever you want and learn as you go. So just try to get some fun done and instead of trying to um, master everything at once. Um, both of the techniques are really good with UIs, um, both in JavaScript and Quit world and the backend as well. Um, my project was actually using Bardin uh, with the Scala, uh, Scaladin adapter as the UI. Um, but these are general techniques. They are not tied to any language or um, any uh, way of working or any library. Even though I have to say that Arax Java is the de facto uh, observable library uh, in the Java world right now. And at least for myself, uh, I get an immense amount of enjoyment when I feel that I'm actually done some really elegant that works well and uh, the amount of uh, box is really, really low, and I think it's much, much more fun than doing the old iterative way. Thank you.